Thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Jim Lee, and I am an associate professor of Asian American Studies and English here at UCI, as well as the new director of the Center for Medical Humanities. Before I proceed with introducing tonight's speaker, I, would I want to say some words of gratitude. First, I want to say here that the Center for Medical Humanities would not be possible without the enormous work of its founding director currently the Vice Chancellor of the Office of Inclusive Excellence and Professor of History and African American Studies, Douglas Haynes. It was Doug who drafted the successful proposal that secured the important Interschool Excellence Initiative that created the Medical Humanities Initiative, the predecessor to the center. So I want to thank Doug for his important vision and leadership. I also want to acknowledge and thank the two center staff who have made this event and all center-related activities possible, Makanani Salah, can you raise your hand? And Joanne Jamora, who's not here. Thank you also to Amanda Swain, the Executive Director of the Humanities Center. And thank you to the deans of our supporting schools of medicine, arts, and humanities, Michael Stamos, Stephen Barker, and Tyrus Miller. This year, much of the center's programming is possible thanks to a generous grant provided by the Mellon Foundation. Its Sawyer Seminar provides resources to enable critical and necessary conversation in our intellectual community. The theme of our Sawyer Seminar this year is the optimistic suffer well. I want to acknowledge Dr. Sarah Oram, who is here this, uh, this evening. Sarah, where are you? Hi, Sarah our Sawyer postdoctoral fellow, and Marlon Maldonado and Max Speer, raise your hands, our Sawyer graduate students, who will be attending events and providing crucial curatorial and networking support for our year-long conversation. I hope you find time to say hello to them and share your thoughts about this and every event we host. Finally, you'll be receiving an email from us in the next day or two, but we value, because we value your feedback and hope that you'll be in conversation with us. Please, if you want to jot this down, go to the following website, bit.ly slash UCI dash CMH feedback. Do you all jot that down? <laughs> Don't worry, you're going to get the email anyway. I won't quiz you on the address. OK, now to our featured program and our inaugural event of the academic year. Dr. Pauline Chen. A liver, transplant, a liver transplant and liver cancer surgeon is the author of Final Exam, A Surgeon's Reflections on Mortality, published by Knopf in 2007 and again by Vintage in 2008, a New York Times bestseller that has been translated and sold in a dozen countries around the world. She graduated from Harvard University and Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and completed her surgical training at Yale University the National Cancer Institute, and UCLA, where she was a faculty member in the Department of Surgery. In 1999, she was named the UCLA Outstanding Physician of the Year. Dr. Chen currently practices at the VA Medical Center in Boston. <clears throat> Dr. Chen, whose work has been nominated for a National Magazine Award, has written for a number of publications, including the Virginia Quarterly Review, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Prevention Magazine. She also speaks regularly to medical and general audiences across the country, including the Association of American Medical Colleges and the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. On a personal note, I first read Final Exam shortly after it came out in 2007 and knew immediately that it would become a staple text in an autobiography course that I teach regularly. It has since become required reading in the medical humanities seminar that I teach for uh, in the medical humanities minor. Some of, some, some of whose graduates are in the audience here. Can you raise your hands? You make me so proud. <laughs> and in each and every time I've done so, I can say without overstatement that this book has changed the lives of so many of my students, perhaps, it's mu perhaps as much as it has changed mine. It may at first glance be counterintuitive, but I hoped tonight that you'll discover that in dwelling on the end of life, yours and mine, we might all learn how to live anew and live well. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pauline Chen to Irvine. 
Thank you. Can, can you all hear me? OK. Um, if at any point you can't hear me, please let me know. I, I don't have a very loud voice. Well, it's a huge honor to be here. But I want to begin my talk with a parable. A parable that the late David Foster Wallace used to tell. It's a parable about two young fish that are happily swimming along in the sea when they come upon an older fish headed the other way. The older fish swims up to them, stops, nods, and says, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on. After a while, one of them looks over to the other and asks, what the hell is water? <laughs> I love that parable because it's about being aware. It's about how we can swim along in our little ponds and streams and rivers and seas and remain utterly, blissfully unconscious of our environment and of the water we swim in. But as much as I like that parable, and as often as it makes me laugh, the truth is that the story also makes me, and I'd wager a fair number of you, just a little bit uncomfortable. I keep looking around and wondering, so what is the water? Or perhaps more apropos to tonight, what is the water of suffering? So allow me to tell you my own fish story. I was in my fourth year of medical school and was spending a month in the medical intensive care unit learning about critical care when Juliet, an elderly woman with pneumonia, arrived. To those of us on rounds that first morning, Juliet looked like the classic little LOL, little old lady, white-haired and with fine, crinkly, paper-thin skin. Because Juliet's medical condition was a bread and butter type of case, the resident in charge of the ICU assigned me to Juliet. I was to consider her my patient. Throughout Juliet's hospital course, Joseph, her husband of more than 50 years, managed to visit every day. Joseph was easily over six feet tall and thin he was what I imagined an elderly Ichabod Crane would have looked like had he lived in Chicago in the 1980s. He showed up at Juliet's bedside dressed in a black overcoat, hat, and gloves, smelling like the home of my sister's elderly piano teacher, a combination of mothballs and musty carpets. His translucent skin was stretched so tautly over his face and beak-like nose that I could see the tangle of fine blood vessels lying just beneath the surface and the S of the artery under his temples pulsating as he spoke. His eyes were blue with crusts in the corners. At certain angles and in certain lighting, his irises shimmered. Juliet and Joseph lived alone in an apartment just outside of the city. Both junior high school teachers, they had met 55 years earlier when their home rooms were right next to each other. They spent most of that school year just smiling. But six months after Joseph summoned up the courage to ask Juliet out for dinner, they were married. When I asked Joseph about first meeting Juliet, he said that she was the most beautiful woman in the world. 
I had occasionally heard fellow classmates sing such praises about their current girlfriends, and I usually laughed at the hyperbole. However, when I heard an 85-year-old man married to the same woman for over half a century say it, I was silenced by the understatement. Juliet and Joseph remained childless, but they were devoted to one another and to the city's public school system, retiring after putting in almost 100 years together. Slowly, over the course of time, they watched their contemporaries and their own siblings pass away until all that was left of their social circle was a distant nephew in another state and a stray friend here or there confined to a nursing home. With their health relatively intact, they settled into a quiet routine. After breakfast, they took a morning walk. The rest of the day until dinner, they read the newspaper, wrote social notes to their few surviving friends, and fussed over bills that arrived in the morning mail. In the early morning of Juliet's admission to the hospital, Joseph noticed that his wife had become lethargic. She had developed a cough over the previous week and a fever the day before. That morning, Joseph found that Juliet could not even answer his questions without falling asleep. Joseph called 911, and within an hour, his wife of 55 years was diagnosed with a life-threatening pneumonia. In the emergency room, a team of physicians surrounded Juliet. As Joseph entered Juliet's room, he could see the white-coated doctors placing a tube into her mouth that would help her breathe. Joseph moved quickly to Juliet's side and tried to hold her struggling hand. Of that moment, Joseph only knew that his last words to his conscious wife were, I'm here, Juliet. I'm here. In response to those words, Joseph later told me, his wife fluttered her eyes and began biting on her breathing tube. That action, spied by emergency room personnel, brought Juliet more sedation, and she would never regain consciousness. In the early days of Juliet's nearly four-week stay, the medical intensive care unit team went over each aspect of her case in excruciating detail during our twice daily rounds. We reviewed every laboratory result. We questioned every potential antibiotic change. We discussed every ventilator setting. As Juliet's pneumonia became more resistant to our therapeutic maneuvers, the attending physician and the residents seemed to become less interested in the finer points of her case. And after three weeks, I barely finished reciting my attempts at a plan for her care before the crowd huddled on rounds moved on to the next patient. The nurses and I continued to roll Juliet over several times a day to clean the deepening raw pressure sores on her back and buttocks. Oozing red flesh craters marked the areas where the pressure of her weight had caused the bones to wear through skin. Accompanied by the constant wheezing and hissing of the ventilator calliope next to her bed, we cleaned out Juliet's breathing tube and sucked out the mucus plugs in her lungs with a long, pliant catheter. We threaded that red rubber tube so far down her airway that it caused Juliet to go into fits of coughing, which in turn would launch her ventilator into its own refrain of whistles, cries, and flashing red lights. Although she was sedated, 
I remember Juliet wincing during these coughing spells, her torso arching up and her hands reaching frantically for the railings. Whenever I saw Joseph, I would wander over to him and try to make conversation. I wondered what he thought every time we asked him to step outside of the room so we could take care of his wife. I wanted to know if he could hear the clanging alarms or the harsh throaty cries coming through Juliet's breathing tube. I wanted to apologize for hurting his wife every time he stepped outside of her room at my request. And I wanted to ask him if he was angry that the only people he ever talked to were the nurses and the medical student. I worried about Joseph. He always came alone, and at times he seemed like little more than a wraith that the infamous Chicago wind had blown in. More and more, Joseph fell asleep at his wife's bedside, his head against the safety railing of the bed, and his hand still locked in hers. His cheeks began to appear unevenly shaven, and occasionally a white rim of dried toothpaste lined his thin, chapped lips. Joseph's smell changed, too. There was the faint odor of urine, now laced in with the mothballs and musty carpets. On the night Juliet died, Chicago was buried by one of the worst snowstorms of the decade. One of the senior residents called Joseph to tell him that his wife was unlikely to make it through the night. I know Joseph struggled to get to our unit. I know because the radio kept announcing that the salt shortage would prevent Chicago streets from getting plowed until the morning. Having been stuck at the hospital the previous night on call, I was busy trying to figure out how to make one change of clothes last another day. I sat at the nurse's station, directly in front of Juliet's bed, and stared at her monitors. The heartbeats began to slow, and the once regular waveforms took on a jagged irregularity images of the last contractions of life. I knew that Joseph did not have much time to get to Juliet. When Joseph arrived, he pulled up his usual chair and took off his dark hat, gloves, and coat. He sat down, maneuvered his hand between the metal safety railings, and held Juliet's hand between his cold fingers. He whispered to her and bent his aged head over hers. A nurse switched off the erratically beeping cardiac monitor in Juliet's room and gently closed the curtain around the two of them. Joseph finally emerged from the room with his coat in his hands. From the monitors at the nurse's station, I knew that Juliet's heart had finally stopped. I approached Joseph, asking him if he would be all right going back out into the snow. I did not know what else to say. There was no one else there to talk to him. The residents and attendings had disappeared. Joseph shook his head at my offer of help and walked out of the ICU. Almost 30 years later, 
I can still see that tall, ghostly figure leaving the unit. The halls are dark and empty, and the walls shimmer with reflections from the windows of snow falling quietly onto the Chicago streets. Not long after I graduated from medical school, the Journal of the American Medical Association published the results of a landmark study in end-of-life care. A group of researchers asked the question, how do we do when it comes to caring for the dying? With millions of dollars in funding, this study to understand prognoses and preferences for outcomes and risks of treatments, which I will here on in refer to by its acronym, the SUPPORT study, first assessed the quality of care provided by hundreds of physicians and healthcare workers to thousands of patients with life-threatening diagnoses. The initial findings were dismal. A large proportion of terminal patients spent their last days in an intensive care unit. A majority of physicians had no idea what their patients wanted in terms of resuscitation. And according to family members, fully half of hospitalized patients who remained conscious at the end of life complained of moderate or severe pain at least half the time. Now, with these results in hand, the support researchers discussed possible ways to respond to what seemed to be significant deficiencies in communication and information. They decided to implement the most intensive interventions possible. They hired specially trained nurses these nurses talked to the patients and their families about their diagnoses, their prognoses, their understanding of their prognoses, and their preferences regarding treatment at the end of life. The nurses then communicated regularly with the patient's physicians and with the hospital staff. The researchers also created frequent reports based on a sophisticated computer model of survival prognosis and on interviews with patients and their families. And they took these reports and inserted them into the patient charts. After two years, the support researchers examined the results of these active interventions. And what did they find? No notable improvement. Terminal patients in the last six months of their lives still received aggressive treatment, and many of them were in the intensive care unit. A high percentage of these patients continued to complain of moderate to severe pain at the end of their lives, and a large number of the physicians still had no idea of their patients' final wishes regarding cardiopulmonary resuscitation and artificial life support. So even with the most intensive interventions possible, like these specially trained nurses, to help facilitate conversations and frequent chart reports updating patient prognosis and conversations, patients still died in pain in the ICUs and not at all in the manner that they wanted to. In other words, these patients were still suffering at the end of life. Now, we would all like to think, ah, that study is 25 years old. We don't let patients suffer like that anymore. Not too long ago, Julie Rosen, the executive director of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare, which is a Boston-based nonprofit dedicated to strengthening the relationship 
between patients and caregivers, Julie emailed me a copy of a survey they had just released. The survey was on the state of compassionate care in this country. For this survey, the Schwartz Center people first spoke to 800 hospitalized patients, then to 500 physicians who treat hospitalized patients. They described compassionate care, the Schwartz Center people, defining it as a relationship between clinicians and patients and their families that focuses on improving communication and emotional support that patients receive from their clinicians. So they defined compassionate care, and then they asked both the patients and the doctors about the importance of compassionate care and their experiences with such care. The patients and the doctors agreed on a wide array of issues. Both groups believed that compassionate care was important for successful treatment, that it made a difference in recovery from illness, and that good communication and emotional support made a difference in whether a patient lived or died, or suffered or not. But there was one striking finding. Despite the fact that the doctors stated that communication and emotional support were vital to good patient care, only about half of all patients said that they were involved in decisions regarding their treatment. Fewer than a third of the patients even knew who was in charge of their care when they were in the hospital. Now for months, that finding bothered me. It bothered me because in every single major study of compassionate care, this lack of communication was at the root of patient suffering. Why weren't the doctors stepping up to the plate? Why weren't they doing what they professed to believe? And why were they so passive when it seemed to count the most? So I found my answer a few months later. And strangely enough, it wasn't in another survey or medical article. I found it in a book by a British linguist named Guy Deutscher, a book called Through the Language Glass. In his book, Deutscher argues that language instills in us an orientation to the world. It instills in us our emotional responses to objects affecting our beliefs, values, and ideologies. Furthermore, unlike other researchers in his field, Deutscher goes on to assert that language does not just allow or not allow us to think about certain things, but rather habitually obliges, obliges us to consider them. He writes, when your language routinely obliges you to specify certain types of information, it forces you to be attentive to certain details in the world and to certain aspects of experience that speakers of other languages may not be required to think about all the time. And since such habits of speech are cultivated from the earliest age, Deutscher continues, it is only natural that they can settle into habits of mind that go beyond language itself, affecting your experiences, perceptions, associations, feelings, memories, and orientation in the world. Deutscher illustrates this assertion with a rather titillating example. If, he writes, you want to tell someone in English that you, on the night your spouse was away on business, went for dinner with your single neighbor, you would only have to be scrupulous about recounting the timing of the event. We dined, we have been dining, we are dining, or we will be dining. But there is no need to mention if that neighbor was a man or a woman. But in, let's say, French, that would be impossible 
To recount the story, you would have to divulge the gender, as in ma voisine for a woman or mon voisin for a man. Now, while there are linguists, and I certainly do not consider myself one, who disagree with Deutscher's premise, there's something very compelling about it. And for those of us who come from crazy, linguistically confused backgrounds can attest, we all have stories that support Deutscher's claims. My parents, for example, are perfect examples of this kind of language influencing perceptions, orientations, and experiences theory. They grew up speaking Taiwanese, a dialect of Chinese, where the differences between he, ta in Mandarin, and she, again, ta in Mandarin, are irrelevant, at least linguistically speaking. And for most of my childhood, they use these third person singular pronouns interchangeably without regard for the gender of that third person and sometimes with kind of awkward consequences. Years ago, my father, who is a very gentle soul at heart, came home devastated because that day, a transgendered employee at his small bakery took him to task for confusing he with she when referring to her. And he was utterly devastated. But whether you agree or disagree with the extent to which language shapes us, one thing is clear. Deutscher's ideas provide an interesting framework with which to examine the work done by physicians. From the moment doctors learn to speak the language of medicine, they are taught to express themselves in the passive voice. The patient is a 45-year-old male who was given a pneumothorax during a procedure, as if accidentally puncturing someone's lung were a gift. <laughs> an 18-year-old female whose hospital course was complicated by an iatrogenic infection as if the infection was caused by something the doctor or providers was, was actually a malevolent little sentient being. <laughs> a 72-year-old female who was managed, as they say, expectantly, as if the doctors and the patient had nothing else at stake but to do, to do but to wait around. <laughs> Even in the realm of popular culture, the passive voice conveys a sense of doctor talk. On any television show with a physician as a character, for example, you know when the doctor is talking business because he or she suddenly lapses into the passive voice. Patients are always given treatments or have things done to them. The doctors never do anything or appear as the subjects of sentences. They never take responsibility within the framework of the sentence Whatever happened to subject, verb, object? But in this professional patois, patients are also hardly active. The patient presented to the emergency room with a persistent cough and fever, sustained a gunshot wound to the abdomen, and perhaps the best of all was pronounced dead. This preponderance of the passive has fascinated medical sociologists for years. In the late 1980s, medical sociologist Rene Ansbach wrote that case presentations are a linguistic ritual that, quote, employ a stylized vocabulary and syntax which reveal tacit and subtle assumptions, beliefs, and values concerning patients' medical knowledge and medical practice to which physici physicians in training are convert, covertly socialized. The passive voice emphasizes the action or observation described rather than the agent, usually a physician or another clinician, or the object, the patient. And in the case of an action or decision, the passive voice mitigates responsibility 
And with observations, it lends authority. Some might even say that the passive voice asserts power and makes doctors and clinicians feel just a little bit special. In other words, the language doctors use in talking about patients, the mother tongue of medicine, the passive voice, does little to foster the kind of emotional support and communication integral to compassionate care. Rather, it obliges doctors to objectify the very people they seek to care for. The passive voice provides an invisible but powerful hurdle to true patient-centered care. The passive voice is, I believe, an important cause of suffering in American medicine. But it's also a cause that I believe doctors and patients can overcome with a little help from literature or rather from literary criticism. In 1893, Victor Shklovsky, a leading literary theorist of his time, published an essay titled Art as Technique. In it, he attempted to define what made great literature. He wrote, if we start to examine the general laws of perception, we see that as perception becomes habitual, it becomes automatic unconsciously automatic. Such habituation explains the principles by which, in ordinary speech, we leave phrases unfinished and words half expressed. Now we all know that phenomenon well. How often have we caught ourselves finishing the sentences of our best friends or loved ones just knowing what they were going to say? In medicine, Doctors understand exactly what their colleagues are saying because they use the same linguistic formulas to present their patients in notes, dictations, and even to one another in the hospital halls. What Sklovsky proposes is that writers who want to produce great works must defamiliarize the familiar. That is, replace conventional ways of seeing with perceptions anew. He advocates remembering what French poet Paul Valéry once wrote, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. What would forgetting the name mean in doctor's work in medicine? It would mean seeing the 92-year-old who walks into the emergency room not as some guy who just presents with esophageal cancer, but as a World War II veteran who has been struggling to eat and drink and survive in the months after his wife died. It would mean seeing the woman pronounced dead last night, not as the 15th mortality of the year for the ICU, but as a woman who died with her husband by her side a woman who devoted her professional life to her students and was not all that different from the woman who taught you how to read, write, and tie your shoelaces. It would mean adopting a language of medicine that reflects real patients, real doctors, real people, and real relationships between them. Shklovsky believed that the greatest of writers, photographers, dancers, artists, and poets were those who practiced the art of defamiliarization, of translation, of defamiliarizing the familiar and forgetting the name of what one sees. I believe that the greatest hope for the future of medicine, for those who suffer, patients, and doctors alike, lies in doing away with the passive pull of the language we have inherited and replacing it with the active comfort, vital healing, 
and dynamic hope of truly compassionate care. And I know that that is possible. I am someone who went to medical school wanting to help people. I pursued this goal with enough purpose to get me through four years of medical school and nine years of surgical training. I got good grades, pulled my share of night call, and stayed late at the hospital on my nights off. But I also learned to revel in the comfort of the passive. I shielded myself from the suffering of my patients by stressing what had occurred and not what was lived. I avoided shouldering difficult emotional responsibilities by emphasizing the action and object, but not the agent. I work this way every day and most every night until one night when one person did something I had never seen before. Until one night when a single individual defamiliarized what had been so familiar. Until one person stepped up to the plate and made me see my work and what I could do as I had never seen it before. When a patient is dying in the intensive care unit, the protocol is always the same. Door or curtains are closed around the patient and family. The nurse turns off the monitors so the family does not have to hear the cardiac monitor go flatline. And physicians scatter in order to give the family some privacy. I spent countless hours making myself scarce while waiting for patients to die. Sometimes the deaths took an hour, sometimes an entire afternoon. Eventually, I would catch sight of family members coming out, limp Kleenexes crushed in their fists. After the last family member had appeared and the appointed family spokesperson had heard my spiel on what to do next, I went behind the curtains to pronounce the patient officially dead. One patient's death, though, was different. He was a retired businessman whose colon cancer had spread to his liver and lungs. It was 4 a.m. when the man's heart began to fail, and I telephoned my attending surgeon at home. Within a half hour, the surgeon arrived. Soon afterward, the patient's wife appeared at the entrance of the ICU. She was of average height and build, with sparkling diamonds in her ears and long gray hair that she always wore swept up and twisted. I had talked with her many times about her teaching at a nearby high school, about their 30-year marriage, and about the fact that she knew that her husband did not have long to live. Every afternoon, she would jump up to greet me and then ask me to step outside the room for a moment. In the hallway, she would ask me when her husband could leave the hospital to die at home. She stopped asking when he became comatose and was transferred to the ICU. The woman now stood stiffly, her eyes red and puffy, and her lips drawn tightly closed. I tried to smile, not sure of how to greet a woman who was about to watch her lifelong partner die. 
all I could think of saying was, I'm sorry. She nodded in response and looked over toward her husband's room. I felt myself pulling away. I could not convince myself that the woman would be happier alone with her dying husband, but there was little I could do to stop. It was as if the familiar habit of going away had already been set in motion. I took a step back and fell hard against a chair, having tripped over my own feet. My attending surgeon took the woman's hand and quietly explained what was happening. Her mouth opened and she began sobbing. He gently led her to the room where I saw her jerk forward, crumpling in front of her husband's bed. The surgeon then walked back toward me, but instead of leaving the woman in the room alone, he closed the curtains around the three of them. I hung back for a few minutes, but became curious when the surgeon did not step out. What was he doing in there? Why didn't he leave her as we always did? I peeked in. Inside, the woman was still sobbing, but she was standing with her hand in her husband's. The surgeon stood next to her and whispered something. The woman nodded and her sobs subsided. Her shoulders relaxed and her breathing became more regular. The surgeon whispered again, pointing to the monitors and to the patient's chest, and then gently putting his hand on the patient's arm. He was, I thought, explaining how life leaves the body. The last contractions of the heart, the irregular breaths, the final comfort of her presence. The woman nodded and began crying softly and stroking her husband's arm. Thirty minutes passed before the surgeon stepped out. Soon after, the patient's wife appeared. Her husband had died. She thanked us smiled weakly, and walked out of the ICU. She sent me a note a couple of weeks after her husband died. She wrote that although her husband did not die at home as she had always hoped, he had died a dignified and peaceful death. And that, she wrote, was all we really wanted. I kept that note with me for a long time afterward as a reminder of what doctors could do. And long after I had filed it away in my patient correspondence file, I would reach into my white coat pockets as if the note were still there and fall back on my memories of that morning as if they could encourage me forward. I stopped slipping away from my dying ICU patients and their families. Instead, with my hand in my pocket, I would usher the families into the ICU. I would bring them to their loved one's bedside and close the curtains around, not them, but us. I would point to the irregularities on the monitor and describe the characteristic last breaths of the dying. I would touch family members, hold those who looked particularly lost, 
and tell them of the final comfort of their presence. I never discussed that morning's events or the contents of the woman's note with my former attending surgeon. I never revealed how his actions that night affected me. I never told him that it was as if a shade had lifted ever so slightly, letting in the first rays of light. And that, from that moment on, I would believe that I could do something more than just cure. This narrative, then, is my acknowledgement to him. And this talk is my acknowledgement to all of you. In the talk where he tells his parable of the fish, David Foster Wallace goes on to say that the truth, that's truth with a capital T, is about simple awareness, awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is the water, this is the water. So, let us remind ourselves, this is the water. This is where we live and die. So thank you. Thank you for your fearlessness in addressing suffering in our world. Thank you for your courage in asking how we can prevent ourselves from becoming complacent and even blind to routine. And thank you, all of you, for this extraordinary seminar that I believe will help to bring about a sea change to not only this community, but also the world. A sea change where we stop, look at our world, defamiliarize the familiar, and redefine suffering and living. Thank you.